thank you, Sharni, for your very generous introduction. And you could not have chosen an appropriate time for conducting this particular seminar because in the past three months, uh, a significant and a substantial role reversal has taken place because of the lockdown. Many of the traditional activities of the men have been performed by women and many of the traditional activities which were assigned to women have been performed by men. So I think under such circumstances, when these issues are addressed globally, people are already sensitized because of their active participation in the activities which are universal in nature. And this is for the first time uh, I feel that as a coherent family unit, everybody has been contributing to the success of the smooth functioning of family. Now, this is what is the key factor in terms of equality and right. Rather than saying that whatever you can do, I can do, it is necessary for us to look at the fact that who can do it best? And if anyone can do it best, then that is the most efficient way of doing things. And that is the way you empower not necessarily women, but also children. So the traditional types of job separation which has occurred is kitchen has been assigned to women and outside jobs assigned to men has no longer been valid and it has been a team effort and the job separation has no longer any significance in the modern world. As you can see that when you look at uh, the type of activities which are performed by women in industry, women in um, corporate world, you will find sometimes their success and their efficient working make men quite jealous that the traditional format in which they have had their dominance is being slowly eroded. But it should not be looked at that way. It should be looked at the fact that in case of emergency like COVID-19, people are capable of replacing one another, not only um, in specific jobs, but in all the jobs and activities which otherwise would have been assigned to specific gender are no longer assigned. In the field of science and technology, I have been in it for the past 35, 40 years now, and many affirmative actions have been taken to establish and to address the issue of gender equality and women's right and empowerment. Uh, especially the 30% reservation for women in the area of science and technology has seen a significant increase in the number of women graduates, women scientists, women entrepreneurs coming up. And I'm sure this percentage will go on increasing. And this percentage will allow you to bring in a slightly different uh, flavor and a slightly different orientation, which because of a difference in the physiology, somehow each one each sex is incapable of understanding or sometimes incapable of realizing it. Sometimes things are done not intentionally, but intentionally and mainly because of the kind of upbringing which they go through and the kind of uh, uh, activities which they involve themselves throughout their career. But these situations are slowly changing and people are willing to give each other chance. And if you see today, uh, you pick up any cookery show that equal number of chefs who which are um, men and equal number of chefs which are there in, in the form of their women expertise which traditionally would not have been the case. So it also indicates that the fields are now equally accessible to both the genders and this is the beginning and start of the gender equality. So my opinion and my suggestion to Shalini that the, this, this discussion should go on in terms of equality and the rights will automatically come. They need not be emphasized. They need not be stressed upon. Once you start addressing the issue of equality and let best do the job in its most optimal way, and that is going to be the sustainable 
way for future. I would like to compliment you for organizing this particular seminar and I would like to wish you and the participants a great debate and discussion and I'm sure you will be able to take some learning from today's seminar. Thank you, Shalini. Thank you so much, sir, for your very inspiring words. And uh, yes, we will we will learn from uh, programs, and definitely from this program, we will have many more learnings, discussions, and many will benefit. And we do not have to look at women or men equality, but overall the equality and automatically the, the right will come to know. So before I go uh, to the introduction of our next speaker. I would like uh, Professor Padma, Madam, to just give uh, the background and uh, introduction of TechWip, who has supported this program. Uh, so, Padma, Madam, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shalini. Uh, this program, uh, for the benefit of all those all the participants who are attending, is organized under the aegis of a very important World Bank program called TechWip, that is Technical Education quality improvement program. And this is a very visionary program of the World Bank, which is currently in phase three. And ICT has been very lucky to be part of phase one, phase two, and is now among the leading institutes also in phase three. A very important aspect of TechWIP is that it looks at improving quality by giving all round comprehensive support for the ambience, for the infrastructure, and also addresses faculty, staff, and students. So it's a very comprehensive program. And one very important aspect of this program is gender equity, or we may say today gender equality. And also under this TechWeb3, ICT is mentoring two institutes across different states. One is the BIT Mesra at Jharkhand, and the other is the Government College of Engineering, Keonjar at Orissa. And we have participants from both those institutes as part of this program because we are the mentor institute for these two institutions. And gender equity, equality being a very important aspect of TechWeb is what is the motivational factor for us to organize this very important webinar series and I would really like to compliment Dr. Shalini, our very young, effervescent, and enthusiastic faculty member for having taken the lead and put up such a wonderful program for all of us. So over to you, Shalini. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your encouragement. And without taking much time, I would like to introduce our second speaker, who is my very good friend, and um, we have worked together uh, as a co-lead in Global Young Academy member. And uh, we, we work together as a lead uh, in Global Young Academy for Women in Science Working Group. And she's one of the best leader. And uh, not only for that, but on various platforms, she has been performing and currently she is associate professor at the Department of Economics at University of Pretoria. And uh, Rona is also co-chair of SIAS. It's a South African Young Academy. And uh, not only that, on international platform also, she's vice president of International Association for Energy Economics. In addition to that, I have observed Raula very closely. She's a very good writer, a blogger, and um, many women from international, women scientists from international forum always ask and take a lot of inspiration from Raula. That's how she manages. She has a beautiful, you know, family with kids, and and uh, for particularly women scientists, it's always a big question that how one manages both professional and personal life. Of course, you know, and having so many ambitious career with so many awards is not a easy task. So, and. Um, with this short introduction, I would like uh, to give this platform to my very best friend, Raula Inglesi. Over to you, dear. Thank you very much for the introduction. 
Um, so, Lenny, do you think I can share my screen? Because I have a few slides to share it. I see I cannot be. Are you able to share? No, apparently it says. Shalini, you got to make Rolla host and then she'll be able to share it. Okay. Now, can you share? Let me check it there. Now, now, now I can. Yes, I uh, changed the. Yeah, you change it, change, make Rolla host. Every speaker, you can make that speaker a host and then they'll be able to share it. Yes, excellent. Second, now can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Yep. Wonderful. Okay, so first of all, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the invitation. Uh, wonderful to be in India, although I'm not in India. If, if everything was um, how it was supposed to be, I would have been in India in June with the Global Day Academy, but unfortunately, with COVID, many of these plans had to be cancelled. I'm glad to be here and share um, ideas. Thank you, Shalini, for the invitation. Thank you for, for the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity. And um, I'm very glad, I was very glad to hear the, the introductions um, um, because I heard about the way of, I heard about the way, sorry. I think. Maybe we can ask the participants to mute their mics, please. Okay, thank you. I request everyone to mute your mics, please. Okay, lovely. So what I was listening and I was smiling was about this idea that science is, is going towards, academia and science is going towards equal opportunities for males and females. We, we are on the path there and we much better than many other sectors in, in, in our economies, I must say, globally. Um, now, one of the steps for all of this is um, many women need to be ready both to grab these opportunities and they both need to be empowered to grab these opportunities. So the one step is to provide opportunities for all, but on the other side is make sure that the conditions are the same for all. And I think that's uh, Shalini invited me to, to speak on my experience about balancing all of these different things in a, in a woman's life, especially in academia where, where I work in. So, women's identity nowadays has numerous roles. Now you can imagine even more when we're talking about the role of, uh, of an academic, which is dimensional. Um, one can argue all professions have different features and requirements, but uh, academics are required to be teachers and researchers and administrators and supervisors and try to make societal change and they need to be academic citizens. So uh, on a given day, we might need to write a reference for a student, develop teaching materials, read and comment on a PhD dissertation. We need to review a journal article, organize a workshop and when we talk about our real work, most of the times we mean research, but all of these things are coming within our work environment. We don't mention the other roles that, or other roles that we play as, as women. So a question I had, and, and that was interesting with, with the choices that Shalini made when, when she made the presentation. You, you can clearly see from Shalini that she understands the issues of, of women in science. What do we say when we are asked to introduce ourselves, especially in professional environments? And does this represent actually what we, what we do daily? So when I'm asked to introduce myself, I usually say I'm an associate professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Pretoria. So people imagine me in conferences with my students, presenting things with my mentors and my boss and, and trying to, to, to do all of these things that academia does. But is that really everything I do daily? Uh, and as Salini said, um, I'm, I don't do only that. I'm also a wife and a mother and, and I have two boys. And those of you that have boys understand that they're a little bit busier than the girls. Well, and you know what? I'm not only that. I'm, I'm more than that. I work with 
people from all over the world in various organizations. I work with Global Young Academy. I work with the South African Young Academy of Science, with the Future Africa Institute. I work with the Africa Science Leadership Program. So I, I work with different organizations and that's one might call that my academic hobby. Okay, so extra in my hours. And you know that what is happening is I'm not only doing that, I'm doing more things. I'm, I'm also a person. I love belly dancing and I love watching soccer and I love reading, and I love painting, and I love running and I love spending time with my friends. So usually from all of this, one realizes that there are many, many aspects of a woman's life that are not uh, necessarily captured in the answer, I'm an associate professor at the Department of Economics. So what are the frequent questions? Salini already asked some of them. When does one have time for all of these? How do you manage balance being a mother and your academic career? When do you have time for yourself? And answers many of the times are, I'm not always saying all of these things. Sometimes I would respect the, the, the person or depending on how the question is asked. But first thought is the day still has 24 hours for all of us. I don't have more hours than other people, unfortunately, but I don't have more hours than other people. I also have 24 hours in every day of mine. And in the past, and I've made a conscious effort not to do that anymore. I used to say, I don't value sleep that much. But understanding that when, I res when somebody responds like that, there are consequences to, to my own mental health. It's I realize the fact that I don't sleep a lot, which is not a good thing. And also, I, I provide an example to students, to other women that listen to me, to the youth that is listening to me, not only women, but men as well, that uh, in order for somebody to be successful, you need to sacrifice sleep. And this is not right. This, this, this should not continue anymore. We, we grew up with this idea, and I'll speak about generational issues uh, just now. But we grew up with this idea that the more we work, the more we, we are valued, and it's, or the more, the, the more we are worth. And that's why we have uh, many people with mental health problems currently. The, the last question that comes as an answer to these questions is, will you ask my male colleagues the same? So many times we go to interviews and among other things, and after they ask about our research, the, first que the, the next question is, how do you do all of these things while being a mother as well? But I haven't heard many interviewers asking the same thing to, to fathers to males in, in academia. How do you do all of this while being a father? Uh, so it is a question I, I always have in my mind. Will you ask my male colleagues the same? So what are the reasons for work-life imbalance for women? And let me start by first saying that I personally don't agree with the, with the concept work-life balance, because I believe work is also part of my life. So I would maybe phrase it as work, non-work life, or work and personal life, or work and private life. Um, why do women experience this imbalance more than, than men? Okay, and I'm not saying, let me make this clear from the beginning. I'm not saying that uh, women have stress and men do not stress. I'm, I'm not trying to make this point here. All I'm trying to say is that there is this certain Im imbalance that the women feel that they need to fix. And let me give you some of the reasons that I have encountered while reading through the, the, the subject or while talking with other women and trying to find what's, what's the issue. Is, um, as a biological, is biological reasons. Women are often the default chore doers and child tenders. Women are the carers of small babies. When a baby is born, they are the only ones that can breastfeed, for example. So if something starts like that, it's difficult to change uh, through the years. So it remains like that. Women are the, the, the parents with the most responsibility of the kids in a household. Next, I, I have encountered cultural and societal um, um, regions behind this imbalance. Men are generally considered or referred to as good providers when their value uh, is summed up, while women are more praised for being good wives and good mothers, and then 
good providers or good professionals. In some cases and in some sectors, uh, the, the, the concept of an ambitious woman is, is perceived as a negative characteristic. It's something that people should not achieve. An ambitious woman is, is, a, is an aggressive woman in many cases. Um, men are expected to be aggressive in business, to, to negotiate aggressively. Um, common stereotypes make women um, or, of what women should do and what can do uh, is what young girls are raised with. If I hear the whole time that my mother can do or should do certain things, then I grow up with the idea that that's the things that I can do and I should do as a woman as well. So it becomes a second nature. When a man has a family and a successful career, then we say that a man has it all. It's, it's societal perception. Um, if a woman has it all, then we start wondering if a woman um, has her priorities right. So if the kids go to a daycare, the first question is related with a woman's career, with a mother's career, and less with a father's career. Um, for example, I experienced that in my everyday life. When I travel, when I go to conferences, everyone in, in our um, structure, in our support structure, praises my husband for taking care of the two boys or tells me how, how lucky I am that I have a husband that takes care of the two boys for long periods of time. And they even offer help to him. Please let me know and I'll call. Uh, anytime you need something, call us. You, you're going to be alone with the boys. When he travels for long periods of time, it is business as usual. It is expected of me to take care of the family. Uh, it's not this big deal. Nobody tells me he's, he's very lucky to have me because I'm, I'm a natural uh, uh, carer of the kids while he's away. So sometimes the work-life balance feels like a concept that was created to allow women to work. So yes, we allow you to work, but provided you make sure that you have everything else at home um, under control. Also, men biologically, culturally, societally are raised to believe they're strong and they're their providers. Um, and I have an example where I, I almost offend, I, or not I almost, I offended a co-author of mine because we were working very hard during December and he's not in the same country as me. So we were exchanging emails very often, but I used to take two or three days off so that I can be with my family during holiday time. And when he didn't take this, this breaks, I asked him, do you ever take breaks? I was worried about his mental health. He was, he was not stopping work at all. And when I asked him if he, he needs to take a break or if he ever takes rests, he was offended because it, it was almost like I, I told him he's not adequate enough, he's not good enough. Well, the only thing I was doing was caring, the, you know, the, the natural instinct of women to care about people around him. But he felt I was, I was offending him by telling him he's not good enough and he needs to take a break. We also have reasons like generational issues, uh, generational reasons. So our generation, and, and I think the next generation as well, we value commitment. Our work ethics are strong. And we all live in an unstable global environment with COVID now even more, and especially with regards to employment. So we have learned to be grateful for having a job to provide security to our families. Um, we value, value hierarchy and hence we are thankful for the opportunities that are given to us and for the trust the, the seniors are giving to us. So we don't say no easily. If my boss calls me and he asks me to do something, I feel the the, the, the work commitment that I have to do it, even if it is on, at my own expense. Um, we also, in many cases, experience low self-esteem, uh, and that's a, a common characteristic among, among women. Um, we all suffer, most of us, especially in academia, of the notorious imposter, imposter syndrome. We don't believe we are good enough for the job we do. We think we are there by luck. We don't believe in ourselves. And then the, the vicious cycle starts in most cases since the years we were students, where the system, in order to keep us in order and discipline, taught us that we will never be good enough or as good as the teachers. The teachers are there and we are always there. Such feelings are particularly common 
among female academics due to the lack of role models um, to associate themselves, to, to, to look at as, an, as examples. And then low self-confidence, of course, has low, uh, um, low productivity effects, and, and that creates um, a, a bad circle. Also, we all live in a competitive, in a very competitive environment. So we suffer from stress and anxiety. We try to be perfect. We want to be good at everything we do, and we want to make an impact. The competition is big, and the workload does not get smaller, and especially in the beginning of our careers. Uh, that contributes to the increase of stress and anxiety, and sometimes we forget we are also humans. Also, the nature of academic work is a reason for, for this imbalance, and this, this little bit of a freedom of an academic creates this sometimes negative consequences. So, for example, I can leave my job, well, when we were going to the office, not now, but I could leave the office earlier to fetch my boys from school and take them to soccer training. But that meant that that specific night, I will have to make sure I mark my papers or tests or finish a paper or do all my work after I put them to bed, which means I will only sleep for three hours, or four hours, four hours at night. Yes, I gained the time with my kids, but at the same time, I, I, that had an effect on my so then with that, with that way of thinking, who expects balance from us? The reasons makes us expect balance, the family, the work environment, our partners, our kids, our boss. But in essence, the, the, the people that really, really expect balance from us is ourselves, OK? And, it's, it's ourselves that are very critical with and what we can do. And we, it's ourselves that we, we expect more things than what we can do sometimes. So what we say ourselves, and we get usually the points. If I don't do it now, when, when will I do it? And that's usually early career research a way of thinking. It's opportunities, they're coming my way. Um, I should take them. I should say yes to everything that comes my way. I was trapped by someone. How do I disappoint them now? And by disappoint, it might mean that I will say, sorry, I can't make that meeting. We have to say yes to everything because otherwise we disappoint people around us or somebody else will do it. So if I say I don't have time to do it, then they will give it to a colleague of mine. And in a competitive environment, work environment, this might mean that the next time they will want somebody to do it, they will, they will not ask me. Um, saying that I'm busy sounds as I'm important. So that, that's an old school type of, of thinking. When people ask you, how are you doing with work? You say, ah, busy as always. I never stop working. And it sounds like, like I'm, in, I'm an important person for doing that. Um, well, in fact, what I'm saying is I don't know how to manage my projects and my time. Um, I will send that to you at 2 o'clock in the night. They will realize I work hard. That's also the wrong signal. It, it's that, again, I don't manage my time correctly, and that's why I'm working through the night. And unfortunately, um, we do that. Everybody does that. I'm not saying we, I do that as well. I work late at night as well, but it's also a signal that we send to the next generations that this is how work, how academic, academic work should be. It should be exhausting and you should work 24 hours a day, which I don't think it's true. Um, we should work efficiently and smartly. And yes, there are times during our, our, our days, there are days that we, we work harder than, than other days, mean that it's something to, to feel proud of, that I work until late every night. I will never be the perfect mother, but I would rather try than go to bed early or read a book. So this, this idea of a perfection um, and our kids need a perfect mother uh, is, is, is very stressful for many, many of us. 
the dishes cannot wait, I should clean now. My house should be perfectly clean and neat. Our friends are joining tonight, so my house should be 100% um, clean. And that's an extra stress. This, this idea of having everything perfect is, is a very stress. I feel guilty when I spend time with my kids because work is waiting, but I also feel guilty when I work long hours and not spend time with my kids. So it's this constant feeling of guilt that what I'm doing now, I shouldn't do. I should have done something else instead. And, and that's not only for academia, but all working parents have this, this same feeling. Just to give you some statistics, did you know that people who work more than 50 hours a week actually have more work-life conflicts if they set their own hours? So the fact that you work more hours doesn't mean that you have a balance. Let's, let's clear this out. Sometimes the concept of schedule control comes in place where work never ends. So you end up in a constant working condition uh, that is not helpful at all. But working more hours doesn't mean you achieve balance. Satisfaction dips upon working more than 40 hours, only to rise again after 55 hours a week. So it's this concept of sometimes overwork is driven by passion. There are times in my year that I work more than 50 hours um, um, a week, and I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to, to do that because I'm doing projects that I'm excited about with Global Young Academy and with all of these other organizations, and I put more than 50 hours, but it's, it's not the norm. Working more than 50 hours a week raises the risk of heart attack and stroke. And people who work longer hours tend to be more anxious and depressed. Um, that was something that I read and actually I was, I was extremely interested to, to read about because it's very interesting. People's IQ actually drops 13 points when they are in a state of busyness, which shows that working more hours or be constantly busy or working constantly doesn't make us more efficient in, in our work. On the contrary, they, there are studies that show that companies that uh, force their employees to leave the office at specific times and never allow overtime um, end up with more efficient workers. And that was also something very shocking for me. 43% 43, 43 of academic staff has shown symptoms of at least a mild mental disorder. That's almost twice compared with the general population. That's international study. Um, also, another very interesting thing for me was long hours affect the relationship we have with our spouses. And the study that I found also looks at heterosexual relationships, and they find that women suffer more than men. Women whose male partners worked 50 or more hours, so women that the male partner is the busy one, um, they, um, they are more stressed. And they feel the relationships were of lower quality than women that partnered with men that worked 35 to 49 hours. So the more the man works, the, the woman reports higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of um, 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 dissatisfaction of the, of the relationship quality. On the other side, men partner, partnered with women who work for long hours report no differences in stress, time adequacy, or relationship quality. And that's, that's very interesting because that also points to the notion that are women better in multitasking and balancing? Um, is, is this something that is expected from women? So when a woman works more than uh, 50 hours a week, um, she manages to balance everything so that the relationship quality remains the same, uh, while a man doing the same cannot balance everything and keep the relationship quality the same. I, I tend to believe that this is a myth, that women are better in multitasking and balancing. Multitasking and balancing has many, there are many other reasons behind it, other than being a male or a female. It's a matter of personality. It's a matter of, of, of the way we do things. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interest of, of work conditions, and it's many other things how we were raised. But definitely, it's not a male or female um, uh, aspect. We can all multitask and we can all balance or not balance uh, the same. So I know that many of you, especially early careers and postdocs and, and PhD students, 
I have the question now, okay, these are all very good and you're telling us about the balance and no balance and all of these things, but practically, what can I do? Practically, many career gurus will tell you, squeeze work and life into your day, put everything in one. So check your emails while waiting for the kids to finish from an activity, try and fit in many small little times that you have with, with work so that you don't lose anything. Find a hobby to take your mind off work. Um, use technology to your advantage. So answer emails via your cell phone when the family is busy with something else. And when the family is watching TV, you can be with your cell phone and answer your emails and that will save you some time from the next morning um, when you go back to the office. Have, they, have these advice worked for me? I've tried all three of them. Uh, which is the main advice most of the of the um, these career sites give you. And to be honest, none of the three have worked for me personally. On the contrary, what they have done is they have added extra stress in my everyday life. They put me in a continuous uh, feeling that I'm working. Even when I'm waiting the kids to finish from soccer, I'm in a constant working mode. And, and, and that doesn't help my productivity because my mind is constantly busy. It doesn't have time to, to break and, and, and that affects my, my work quality. When it comes to, to, um, to a hobby, yes, as you've seen in my introduction of myself, I'm trying to do many things, but when I try to get a hobby specifically to get my mind away from work, that's when I have problems because then I feel that it is also one thing in my to-do list that I have to do. And if I don't have time to, to color today or to paint today, um, I feel like a, a, a failure tonight because I didn't have time to do that. Um, so what's my advice? What things you can think so that it, it might improve this, this balance, this pursuit for balance, although I'm, I'm going to give you a, a last thought in the next slide. So support structure. Ask for help. Give your help. And support structure, sometimes the family you have around you, it's sometimes the neighbors, your colleagues, the, the parents at the school of, uh, of the kids, it's many things as support. And for people that say that I don't have a support structure because they don't have their parents around, I'm one of them. My parents live in Greece and my husband's parents are almost 14 hours drive from where we stay. So we don't have our, our uh, close grandparents, let's put it like that, to help with the kids. But that's where you, you give your help. So support structure means you give your help, then the other people know that they can trust you. And then in turn, you trust them. You create your support structure. So you take the support structure in your hands. Another thing is discipline and focused attitude. So when you are with your kids, be with your kids. When you are with your husband, be with your husband. When you're with your friends, be with your friends. When it's time for your hobby, leave work outside. And when you work, leave everything else outside. Have a focused attitude so that you take the most from everything you do in your everyday life. Um, another thing is time for ourselves. And it sounds crazy. It sounds, where will I find time for, ourself, for myself? As we said, everybody has 24 hours a day. So where will I find this time? And my advice is schedule it. I love belly dancing and I know that on Wednesdays at half past five in the afternoon, I have my class. Nowadays I do it via Skype, but otherwise I have to be in class. So my family knows that for that hour, it's the time for myself. It's the time that I'm, I'm gonna be in class. So schedule and, and treat it with respect. See your time in terms of seasons, not, not in terms of, of, of trying to, to achieve the absolute balance. So there are times in my year that work takes over. Exam times, everything like that. Work takes over. I don't have time for the family and it's fine. And there are times that the family takes over and it's also fine. Uh, so I don't over, overwork when I go for holidays with the families. And when I say I'm gonna go for two weeks for holidays with the family, I make sure that everything at work, they, they know where I am, they know what I do, but I will not work for this time. So it, there are seasons and it's fine that there are seasons. 
take time away from work without feeling guilty. But in order to do that, you need to plan it and schedule it appropriately. So if I know that I'm going to take two days off, I say to my students and to my colleagues that, you know what, that these two days, I'm going to be off. So if you need anything from me, send it beforehand so that I don't feel guilty that I'm out of, of work. And that, that's, that's something that we should all respect from each other, uh, provided that we don't leave work on somebody else's uh, plate. The attitude of an employer defines the consequences of work-life balance more than the employee. So communication with your employer is, is very important. You need to be able to, to speak with your employer and explain your needs. And in, in turn, the employer should be able to, to discuss with you what the needs of, of work from your side. Schedule time for friends and social interactions as per your needs, okay? So I need more, somebody else needs less, and somebody needs more quiet time, somebody needs less quiet time, but plan it and as you would uh, look at it as you would do with, with uh, formal meetings. Be okay with imperfection, and that's a very hard one, because during our studies, we are all learning to, to do that, to, to, to be perfect, to strive for perfection. But sometimes leaving the, the plates in the, in the basin, to leave them there for tonight, you'll do them tomorrow. And read a book with your kids is more important for that specific night for your mental health than, than anything else. And be okay with, with say, I, I'm sorry, I won't make all the meetings. That, that's also fine. Um, find your purpose, ask yourself, and, and that's something, all of this advice, it's not only for, for women, I guess, it's, it's for men as well. Find your, your own purpose. What is your purpose? And having that in your mind, every single thing, every single thing that might make you tired now, might not make you tired mentally uh, if, if it goes according to your purpose. So my purpose is to, to make the youth have a voice. Every time I do something extra with a young academy of science, which is extra to my work and I have to find hours during the day to do it, I'm happy about it. I'm, I'm getting tired, but I'm not complaining. I'm not mentally uh, unhappy with that. So I'm gonna leave you with a last thought. The, the pursuit for work-life balance can be a source of imbalance itself. So maybe we shouldn't strive for balance. Maybe we should focus on a fulfilling, purposeful, prosperous and stressful stress-free life and accept that we we are not going to have everything balanced there's no balance because there's no 50 50 we do so many things it can be 50 50 let's focus on something that fulfills our lives and accept that some days will be with the one thing or one role more and, and the other day more with the other role let's have in our minds that future generations will judge us not by what we say but what we do and they look at us they look at our examples that we give them so we have a responsibility to show them by our example and not just give a presentation and say things but actually do things that way so that they the next generation knows exactly where where we're going and avoid the mistakes we have made and with that, if you ever want to, to discuss, please reach out. There's my email, my Twitter, my blog. Um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss with, with any of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rola, for what a fantastic talk and um, especially talking about the practicality. Yes, you rightly said there are so many career gurus and uh, they, ha they have been selling these kind of books and uh, you know, there is a lot of material available, but whether that is practical, uh, it, uh, it doesn't work. And when, when we saw your practical uh, tips, because you know, in, in real life, everybody's, the, the world is very competitive. And uh, because of that competitiveness, especially for women, we play multiple roles. And when we play multiple roles, we want to achieve everything. We want to be perfect. We want to be number one. We want to be chair or president and everything. But, and that causes stress, anxiety. And um, 
your 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 advice is so good and i'm sure all the women scientists here both in academic and uh, as such you know postdoc and early career uh, girls uh, they will immensely benefit with your uh, practical advice so so asking help is such a important it's a very simple thing but we never think that you know we always hesitate to ask help you know today i need help just mm -hmm. ask for it and and you know other women is also going through the same thing asking help will also one day you have to give give help to her so helping each other is is going to help everybody discipline and you know living work and your personal life when you are thinking about hobby just focus on hobby when you are with kids just kids because many times you know what happens you even you, if you are with kids you will start you know sending emails to your office people and then you know you are not able to give more time with with the uh, kids and simultaneously you are not able to perform very well in writing emails because your attention is not at one place and then you have overall a guilty and then no outcome so such a wonderful and simple message I, i'm i'm sure we have um, many questions uh, uh, from our audiences but uh, we won't be able to take all the questions so i i put forth here the question asked by dr asha patil and she says how this should be inculcated on girls during the socialization process so women will not feel guilty i think uh, it's a uh, it's not something that we press a button and it happens and that's the the unfortunate thing and that's why we we cannot um we cannot fix this imbalances and this sense of, of feeling guilty easily because really there's not a recipe uh or a button that we can press and then and then women and and girls will feel differently um we can do that by us the the role models of the of the younger generation doing it ourselves and showing to them and talking to them that some level of guilt is also fine because it makes us want to be better but this constant feeling of guilt will lead us nowhere um so i think it's it's a matter of my personal view is it's a matter of role models um that we have around us um it also a matter of of how we raise and that's something i i, I said many times in in other talks i've given um how we raise our boys as well as the girls uh which which we forget about uh because you your your webinar series is about gender equality and i agreed with with uh, with the earlier speaker that said that um let's speak about that and the women's rights will follow because if we don't achieve gender equality and we don't change the the mindsets of the of the boys and the girls nothing will happen so we need to get the good role models out and to start making some changes in the societal perceptions of what a woman should do and what a man should do um and then it's it's the small things with with the girls and the boys it's the small things it's the small empowering girls to think differently and not feeling guilty and it it's empowering also the boys to to see the value of the girls that they play with um so my my 6 year old well my 8 year old 2 years ago when he came back from school um he said to me at some point that girls cannot play soccer so mama we only boys play soccer so girls cannot play soccer and i said to him okay you and me we're going outside now in the street with the ball and i'll show you if the girls can play soccer and and that's that's also part of the educational system so i i'm not very familiar with the primary education in 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 india but in in south africa in many schools we have the idea that girls play a certain sport and the boys play a certain other sport and i always challenge it and say but why because if we allow this to happen the girl that wants to play soccer will always feel uh, uncomfortable and will always feel guilty for not playing with her friends so we need to challenge the education from a, a smaller a, a, an earlier level already before we reach to the phd's and postdocs that can, that can look of course at, at role models 
Oh, thank you so much, Rola. There is one more question I would like to put forth. It is from Ayushi, and she's asking that uh, in and around uh, overall, especially in developing country or maybe in India, you see a lot of gender stereotypes. There is something, you know, taboo in the mind and, you know, breaking that gender stereotype is so difficult. So how to overcome or how, how to, you know, sometimes all do not have that capability to to cross that uh, gender. So what would you like to, you know, guide? I, I think one, one, we as women, we are very, especially the women that work in this forefront, it's, we, we want to change the whole world that all together. We want to take where we are now and put it in the optimal, final, gender equal uh, state, and in, in all in all aspects of aspects of life. Uh, my advice is a step at a time. I think I think that's that's something we we can all do because small wins will bring will bring this bigger change of of, of stereotypes. Um, it's difficult, but I will not change the. It's very difficult to change the approach, and it's not only developing; it's developed countries as well. Because I come from Greece, and it's it it would be very difficult for me to change the the mindset of my grandparents that did not allow my husband to get up and make coffee for me as well. They they would be very upset if the woman would sit on the chair and the man would go to the kitchen to make coffee. To give you a very simplistic example of this. But I knew and I understood that, that the, I'm not going to make a big difference in the mindset of that generation. They've lived their lives in a certain manner. We need to look forward and we, look, we need to make a step at a time. And change starts from home. Change starts from ourselves. With the things that we accept and the things we, we want to fight and the things we want to change or the things we decide not to change and we allow them to become the norm. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. It's not easy. Um, but it's much easier if you break it down into pieces and you do one little step at a time and you celebrate every victory as if it is the ultimate victory. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Rola. Actually, there are so many questions, but I will just take this last question because we have uh, another next speaker waiting for us. So quickly, um, the question is from Akanksha and she's asking, how can we choose a role model in our life? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a very, very good question. Um, and my answer is, is we take good things from many people in our life. So if you ask me what we who is my role model, I'm not going to give you an answer, uh, one person as an answer. I, I like the work ethics of one person and I've learned a lot from my supervisor, was a male supervisor. So I didn't have the, the woman side in that. And I, I learned from my colleagues that can also be my role model and my coworkers that can also be a role model. You don't have to find one person and say, I want to be like that person. What my advice is, when you find a person that you like the way they, they deal with their family, learn from that. And then find another person that you, you like the way they keep themselves in meetings and, and the way they speak to people or the way they do presentations. Learn from them as well. So don't try to find one person. Try and get many positive things from many different people. Well, thank you so much, Rola. So we have many questions, but right now we are running out of the time. And I thank really, you. really thank you so much from my heart. And uh, you're wonderful. And uh, people are people have sent hundreds of messages saying that this is a most relevant question. <laughs> and uh, the, the women scientists especially, they are thanking and they are saying that this is most relevant and not we are not able to address everything in this 30 or 40 minutes of time. We should keep continuing. They're more than welcome to contact me. Whenever they want something, we, I'm here to chat. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, thank you. I am looking forward uh, to have more um, communication or interaction with you on many other platforms. So thank you so much, Rola. Great, thank you very much. So now we have our next uh, speaker is um, Professor Ashutosh Sharma sir from 
uh, Department of Science and Technology. And uh, I now request Padma Madam to introduce Ashutosh Sharma, sir. Welcome, sir, on this webinar series. Hello, hello. Can you hear, sir? Hello? We can't hear you, sir. It's not audible. It's not audible. It's audible now. See, I've been asking you to unmute me because you muted me. Okay. Oh. Yeah, right. Now you got it. Okay. Very good. So can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much, yeah, sir. And thank you for, uh, for organizing um, such a nice meeting. Um, and our previous speaker, Rola, made some very compelling points, some very practical points. Uh, so it was wonderful to hear her. Um, and um, you, you have a very long series of, uh, of talks, right? For two days. Three days. We have a three, three day days. Session. Uh, that's so fantastic. Uh, so as you know, the Department of Science and Technology has a lot of interest in this theme. Uh, so if you get some actionable points, uh, please let us know at the end of it. Uh, you see, we have been to so many of these conferences, workshops, uh, and meetings. Uh, and I always ask people, I say, look, we all know what the problems are. Now it's time that we start being part of the solution. Uh, and if you give me a solution that would make sense, we would do it tomorrow. <laughs> right, so please keep that in mind. Um, look, uh, since we started talking about the issues, since we started talking about, well, what is it that we are discussing? Uh, clearly, it's about diversity. Uh, to my mind, uh, the overarching theme is diversity. It's about inclusion. It's about equity. It's about empowering people who are not empowered. Now, diversity has many uh, faces. Uh, so it's about suddenly the gender is the most important one because right away 50% of the population, right? But there are other aspects to it, which is, um, you know, geography and India being a very heterogeneous country. Uh, geography, people living in little hills uh, somewhere, living the shoreline, they don't have access uh, to the same uh, opportunities uh, as other people do. Uh, it's about uh, it's about age, uh, you know. So many times, if you are a young scientist, uh, people don't really take you very seriously. Now, the reason I am saying all this is because there are certain aspects which are common. There are other aspects which are specific uh, to gender. Uh, you know, we talk about work-life balance. In fact, I have none in my life. Okay, so I just keep. <laughs> I'm saying, look, I need to learn from other people as well. Right, so I'm thinking work all the time until midnight every day, uh, and so on. But uh, so there are other aspects, you know, language. Uh, this is uh, another aspect of diversity. I know many people who think that if you are from a small town, you are not very intelligent, or if you don't speak English, then you couldn't possibly know many things, right? So these are all stereotypes. Uh, and stereotypes which are so deeply rooted in us uh, that there is, you just cannot interact with another person. You cannot judge another person without a stereotype. And other countries, as we know, is also the color of the skin and so on. So there are a whole lot of these things which are related to diversity, inclusion, and uh, providing a level playing field. Now, a lot of people try to solve this problem by saying, look, uh, that we would have some kind of reservation uh, and, and so on. Uh, this is not uh, an optimal approach. The optimal approach uh, is to create a level playing field, uh, which is to say, okay, what's stopping you? Uh, anything that stops you ought to be removed uh, from there. Um, so, so we know, what, um, see, often people ask this diversity that we are talking about, is that a political slogan? I mean, is that a lip service uh, or what is it? Uh, clearly not. Now we live in the time of a virus. Now imagine if all of us were the same, uh, if we were clones of each other, 
the first virus will finish us all off in no time at all. And this is why a nature uh, respect diversity. Uh, so the perspectives that you would get from different people with different background, even gender, these perspectives are very different. So I, I, I often say, look, the idea you would get from a PhD student would not be the same as what you would get from a little kid in a small town uh, and from a farmer and from a woman living in a small town. And we need all of these ideas. We don't even know what our problems are unless you talk to all these people, much less what the solutions would be. So, so this is the meaning of diversity. Now we know that uh, in well, for, for women scientists, the problem is rather acute. Um, and it's not one problem, okay? So it's not, uh, it's got, uh, you know, different uh, problems at different stages of career uh, in different areas in corporate sector versus uh, academia, uh, right? So there are uh, a variety, uh, a whole spectrum uh, of issues. And so there is not a single solution to this. I mean, I'm speaking as uh, not, in, not coming from the perspective of family and the home, which is clearly a very pervasive cultural uh, issue, uh, right? And this is not something which is going to change uh, overnight, as was clearly understood and pointed out by Rolla uh, before me, um, that this is, is very deep rooted. Uh, anyway, so that, that takes time to change. Now, what is it that a government, for example, can do uh, related to this? What is it that we could do uh, in, in uh, each, my home, for example, a, as an individual, uh, right? So now you, you look at, for example, some areas of technology. Uh, Dr. Arya, you are in a technology institute yourself. How many girls are doing mechanical engineering? Uh, I would imagine that this is very low. Uh, I know that in the top technology colleges in IITs, in NITs, uh, this is about 10%. Now, uh, when I was doing undergrad, this was about three or 4%. So in about 40 years, we have gone uh, from 3% to 10%, which is extremely slow. So you don't have a pipeline. Uh, actually, so it's not just about leaky pipeline in certain areas in certain top uh, colleges, you, you have no input at all. So there cannot be any output. And the output which is there, we know already is very leaky. So after a bachelor's, okay, there's some attrition. After master's, more attrition. After PhD, uh, even more attrition because that's the time that most people marry, for example, and start having children. Uh, so, so there's a whole lot of uh, leakiness in this entire pipeline going from the, from, from the, in, uh, from the entry uh, to the exit. And so is same action uh, would not be helpful in all of these cases. Uh, so if somebody takes, for example, after PhD, after postdoc, even after a job, uh, you know, uh, one takes um, a gap year or two gap years or three gap years uh, because of family, because of relocation, uh, because of uh, children, because of family responsibilities and so on, then it's so much harder to get back uh, to your job uh, in the same way that, that you would have continued or a man uh, folk would have continued in there, right? So th this kind of dislocation, disruption, uh, which happen often, uh, that, that create a lot of problem. Of course, uh, there is this thing about even those who progress further, there is a thing called glass ceiling uh, and whole lot of this is related to networking or the lack of it. And whole lot of this is related uh, to, um, uh, well, you know, the stereotypes, right? So even in the workplace, they say, hey, can women really do this, uh, right? Uh, and people ask, they, they ask this question uh, much more than they would to a man, uh, right? Uh, so so there's a problem, of course, on job harassment, we often hear about it, uh, being in, uh, you know, offices and so on. And my uh, advice uh, to all these women is that they should absolutely, absolutely report it. Okay, often people are a little bit hesitant and they say, look, what, you know, they would get this image that you are a troublemaker and people don't want to be seen as a troublemaker. 
But remember that if you accept harassment, uh, let's not mix it with, uh, you know, professional things. Okay, if my boss is not happy with my work that I do not consider as harassment, right? But there are things, you know, anybody, when you see harassment, you can recognize it. It's not very difficult to recognize it, right? So, so I'm, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've come across many cases, uh, you know, even women who, who resigned because of harassment, but they did not complain. And I learned about it only, let's say, after six months, right? And, and I, I was always uh, very sad, and I was also very intrigued uh, as to what actually not made them report this. Because there are now, see, every office, uh, every ministry, every uh, academic institute is supposed to have a committee, let's say a Visaka committee, right, which are independent people. And I uh, see, unless we push for it, we will not get justice. And there would not be, uh, you know, previous uh, uh, instances of this happening. So people would get very demoralized, uh, right? So, so I think this is my uh, sincere plea uh, to everyone who's listening to this. Uh, if you have a, a real case of harassment of any kind, psychological, sexual, whatever you call it, uh, you must, it is our duty uh, actually to report it. Uh, even if we may a little bit feel odd about it or may even suffer a little bit as a consequence, okay? It, it's just we, it's something, it's a responsibility uh, that we have to do and absolutely zero tolerance uh, for this kind of behavior because that removes already a lot of constraints which are there uh, in women working uh, in different places. Um, in fact, the stereotypes are so uh, entrenched, they are so deep, it's very hard to deal with them. I, I would think all my friends usually are very enlightened people, very educated for sure, right? But now and then you would encounter something uh, which actually tells me not really, right? And it is not their fault, okay? I don't judge them, okay? What I'm saying is, it, it's just the way it is. I mean, uh, it, it's so deep down in some corner of your brain that the response is actually spontaneous. You don't need to think about it, right? So most people do not think about a response when they actually make it. And it is our responsibility uh, as in our family, in our neighborhood, in our workplace to create this awareness. And I've often seen that once this awareness is there, uh, that, that people actually eventually get it. Uh, even today's world is very different than it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. And this has happened because many people have worked on it tirelessly uh, and without selfish motives, right? So now I just, give, I just remembered an example. So, you know, 20th of June uh, was a World or International Wi-Fi Day. And I knew that there was this... Uh, Hollywood actress of 30s and 40s, uh, 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 what was her name? Um, Hedy, Hedy Lamar, right? Uh, it was a little bit before my times. Uh, and so, but, but you know, it's very famous case. Uh, so she was the top actress of her days. Uh, she worked in uh, 40 movies, top movies. Uh, and, um, uh, and she was really, uh, you know, uh, she, she was considered a glamour girl. But she was also the person who came up with the idea of frequency hopping and many other inventions, uh, uh, you know, working as a, as a scientist. I mean, she was not a full-time scientist or anything, but she was working with these teams and then, you know, all these ideas, which are very critical, which are very central uh, to uh, a secure Wi-Fi, a secure Bluetooth, and all sorts of communications that started in World War II. Now, very few people actually know about it. So when I posted this, whole lot of people actually were saying, hey, uh, oh, she had six husbands, right? And uh, people actually wrote it there, say, what an interesting life, of course, and nobody was talking about her scientific contributions, right? And they said, because I gave a Wikipedia link. So they looked up that Wikipedia link and they said, oh, she married six times. And uh, so so, so I, I said, look, I put a comment, I say, uh, None of them were her match, right? She was so much better than all six of these. Uh, and so I think it's perfectly all right if you had six husbands, what's the big deal, right? But it is something that, you know, the stereotype that if you are, oh, if you are blonde, if you are, uh, you know, 
glamour, if you are top star, then you cannot be doing great science, right? And then people immediately jump at your personal life. There may be nothing wrong there, in fact. And this is not something that would happen to very large number of men unless they are evil. Okay, this is certainly not a case of being evil, right? So, uh, so I'm saying that the, the stereotypes, uh, at the same time, uh, most people don't realize that they are actually getting into, into a stereotype. So, so therefore, the, 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 the solution to this is uh, continuous awareness, right? There is no other solution to this uh, because you can't penalize people because stupid things they write somewhere. Uh, so only thing is that, you know, if five people say, look, uh, that this is perhaps uh, not entirely relevant uh, and stuff like that, then they would eventually get the idea. Um, so, of course, having right kind of support system at work and home uh, plays uh, a very important role, needless to say. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, husbands are more responsive to this uh, in the next gen. Um, I know there's a pretty much of a write-off in my generation and one before me and before that. But I think that we are moving in the right direction, even though we are moving more slowly. Now, part of this empowerment is created because of economic reasons. And, uh, and, and those are very powerful drivers uh, of our behavior. So one would like to say, look, uh, it should be something more altruistic. It should be more uh, you know, um, divine and so on, uh, more honorable. A whole lot of our behavior, society, industry, everything is driven by economic uh, parameters, right? So no matter how you look at it, no matter how you look at it, uh, women empowerment is absolutely, absolutely necessary. Uh, keeping 50% uh, workforce, so to say, out of economy uh, would actually not make sense at all, right? This is also very interesting that... Um, you see, uh, women empowerment in science is not always correlated with uh, the degree of prosperity in a society. It's a deep cultural issue. Now, you, uh, there are some countries, you know, I mean, I don't like to name countries, maybe in Asia, very prosperous countries, uh, but uh, women in science are totally absent. Okay, you just, you would, out of 100 professors, you would find five. And those five also... Uh, it's very interesting when I actually probed into this. Uh, out of those five, three are not married ever. Okay, so that says something about it, right? Uh, and so it is. There is no direct correlation uh, between, uh, you know, per capita income of a country and how much of empowerment pe uh, women uh, receive there, especially in terms of uh, their career in science uh, and especially in technology. Um, <clears throat> So, so these are uh, many things there, uh, networking, old boys club. There are countries where people go, uh, you know, go, go to a bar uh, after work uh, and they would hang around there until midnight before returning home. And this is part of social ritual. It is part of their work culture. And clearly, uh, you know, a whole lot of women actually would not fit in there. Uh, so they are, you know, so it's a networking. Uh, becomes uh, extremely hard uh, there. So uh, other thing, of course, is related to confidence and culture, as I was saying. So a whole lot of uh, girls I talked to in high school, uh, they say, look, uh, I think we, are, we can't really be very good with mathematics, with logic, with theoretical sciences, uh, with particle physics, uh, and with mechanical engineering. Uh, and, you know, so these kinds of so these stereotypes are, again, very uh, dearly held. Uh, and... Um, so the whole point is that you see as teachers, as parents, as neighbors, as administrators, as whoever we are, I think all of us are involved in addressing these problems. Now I'll tell you actually what is it that Department of Science and Technology uh, is doing. A whole lot of this has started in the last five years. Um, and since I've been listening to many of these talks and trying to figure out where interventions are needed. Uh, the, the, the first kind of scheme uh, is called uh, VOS. Uh, there are three schemes which are called VOS A, B, C. VOS A is for women scientists who have to move. And because of that, there's a break in their career. Uh, so, you know, it becomes much harder to get back after two or three years 
a five years of break. So during this time, if they can keep flexible working hours and continue their research uh, in, a, in a host lab. So they would get fellowship and they get support for carrying out their research. Uh, and so that way they kind of remain plugged in uh, here until they can find another job. Uh, second one is called WASP-B, which allows women scientists to use their science background uh, to, to, to use it for, uh, for societal activities. It could be empowering farmers. It could be working with children. So it's a little bit like a single woman NGO, if you would, right? The, the third thing is uh, women with science background or engineering background or medicine, uh, they can do a one year training uh, in intellectual property management. Uh, and so this is fully paid in terms of, you know, fellowship and stuff. And we have found that this is a fantastic option. In fact, fully 10% of the IP managers in the country today, they are, they are products uh, of this particular scheme. Uh, and, and I've seen uh, women who have made their own uh, IP law firms uh, and they are certainly you know, working. There's also an area in which uh, you can keep flexible hours, uh, which is uh, at some point uh, uh, in your life uh, for women is very important. Um, then uh, finally, if we look at, uh, you know, the, it was mentioned actually, it's always mentioned about the role models. Right? The confidence comes because of role models. The confidence comes because your parents and your teachers have that confidence in you, right? Because you see, every young kid is going to look up to who? They're going to look up to teachers and they're going to look up to parents uh, and maybe neighbors and relatives. So uh, th this confidence, I, I think is a key uh, that they can, uh, not only they can do it, but they are equally good at it. In fact, they can be better in many uh, things. Uh, so uh, to, to address this particular problem and the problem that we see that in technology areas, in engineering, in the top schools, there are very few women. What that means is they're never going to have a role model. Okay, you're going to have very few role models right? Because it's, you know, society just follows whoever is going in front, right? I know this so well because, you know, parents just keep come and talk to me about, hey, where are the opportunities, what and stuff, right? Everybody wants to follow what the others are doing. And so if we don't have role models, then we have no hope for the future at all. So we need to get more women into top engineering colleges, uh, provide them the leadership uh, of the next generation. And to do that, we are starting this program called Vigyan Jyoti. Now, Vigyan Jyoti, we were supposed to start full program implementation this year, but it's looking more and more difficult uh, because of obvious reasons. Uh, so we are going to start with a, or we are starting out with uh, a pilot project, which would be done in 50 districts. Now, this is a very simple idea that we pick up these uh, top performing girls in high school. And if they are not going to coaching, if their parents are not really made up their mind uh, that they want to go to IITs or NITs, then we enroll them in Vigyan Jyoti program. Uh, this provides a training. I don't want to call it coaching. It provides fellowship where they require it. Uh, it provides most important thing, which is a confidence building and role models do we have class even for parents and teachers, not just for girls? Because girls is not the total solution to the problem, right? Because she doesn't have options, uh, right? So then what we're going to do is look, uh, if, if this girl gets into a, a, a top college in underrepresented areas, then we are going to take care of the entire, um, you know, cost of education uh, going through the college <clears throat> and, and also the pipeline beyond it. We also want colleges, universities, IITs uh, to hire these women, right? So we would pay salary for five years and say, okay, you know, here, I mean, no risk to you. So you, you hire these people and you try them out, isn't it? So, so actually we need some end-to-end -end solutions, but the most important foundational aspect is not later. Actually the foundational aspect, it has to go back to school uh, years uh, and, and especially when the pipeline is just starting out uh, there. Uh, there are also other programs which are related to um, 
uh, providing infrastructure support to all women colleges and universities. Uh, from what I recall that until last year, uh, grants uh, of several crores, up to 10 crores, uh, were provided to each of these universities. And now we are bringing in uh, the centers for artificial intelligence uh, and data analytics to each of these universities. Uh, you see, future is going to look a little bit different uh, than uh, the present and the past, uh, but in not, not in a in a very not changing in a very slow way. I think it's going to look very different because the future is coming at us at faster and faster rate all the time. A lot of disruptive things are happening. Right now, one of the disruptive things which is happening uh, as we are talking here, and we wouldn't have done that uh, four months ago, uh, isn't it? Uh, so uh, now this actually is uh, an instrument of empowerment. And especially I would imagine for women, right? Uh, because see the issues related to physical networking, the issues which are related, some of it is uh, harassment outside of home, uh, some of it is which is related to reaching out larger number of people without traveling, right? So I think the digital future uh, is going to be very empowering in terms of giving and receiving education, information, and be able to work even from home, right? So this is a new dimension that we really have to fully explore uh, and make sure that if there are some sharp corners there, that they can be made smoother, right? So it's a whole new world. It's a whole new future, which is now looking at us. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, you know, mark my words, going down two, three years, uh, even the quality and nature of these meetings is going to change. Now there's going to be more of AR, VR, because right now we are very flat here, right? So you don't get the real experience of what you would get uh, in a physical meeting. Of course, you cannot have a free cup of tea. Okay, which is a separate thing. Whole lot of people call meetings because they want tea and they want gossip. Okay, we can still do gossip here, but you cannot do tea, uh, right? So, um, uh, so all of this is going to evolve. It's going to evolve in such a way that your experience of a meeting uh, is more meaningful. Uh, it is more proximal. Uh, psychologically, it makes that impact uh, that, that people want to get. Uh, right. So all this is going to empower uh, women, uh, removing many of the hindrances uh, that we have today. Um, right. So I think all of you are convinced about that. So we, we have to be part of that future. Hello, friend. Professor Pandit, how are you doing? All well. You, you, you have said your bit or you are waiting for me to finish. You, you are muted, but never mind. It's OK. Um, and finally, uh, another... Um, Sir, I have unmuted Professor Pandit. No, that's okay. I, I made my introductory remarks, and this is exactly in line with what you are talking about. Very good. I enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, two intelligent people cannot say two different things. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> also, corollary to that, the food seldom differ. Yeah, yeah, of course. And we are both chemical engineers. Yes. So, so we are very homogeneous kind of people here, yeah. right? Uh, you see, so finally, there I would say, we are putting in place a thing called ranking and rating framework for gender equality in academic uh, institutions and R&D labs related to science and technology. Now, the whole idea is not to make people feel bad or for them to look bad, right? That's not the idea. Idea is we should know where we are. And we, it's more important that we know what the parameters are based on which we can judge uh, the progress, if any. Or are we sliding back? Are we progressing? What is the rate at which we are progressing? Uh, so we have a base case, right? So once we start this uh, rating uh, ranking framework, uh, then people know where they are, what are the parameters they need to work on. Uh, and so important thing is the measure of change, not who we are. Okay, we cannot change who we are. Right, uh, but we but we can change uh, who we we will be, right? And so this uh, this is a little bit of carrot and stick because nobody wants to look bad, uh, you know. If it is really outside the normal bend, plus minus two sigma limits, right? Then people take note of it. 
hey, this college is not doing good, you know, they need to do something better, right? So this brings pressure uh, on the management, on people, teachers, everybody there, right? So the, the, this should be in place uh, starting this year. Um, so I guess we, uh, I think I've already overshot my time budget. Is that true, Dr. Arya? Yes, thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful and inspiring talk. And this is not for the first time I'm meeting. I, I met you, I remember, in INIA's meeting. I'm, I'm a member of Indian National Young Academy's Friends. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw, sir, he, he, you know, when you see any big personality, like Secretary of Department of Science and Technology, it looks so complicated. And then when, I, when we young, uh, you know, scientists went to him, he was so open, you know, he just spoke about social media media and you know all young buddies uh, talk and then when you when you feel that you know when you look at him you may not feel that he's young oh sorry sir but then you know your talks are so young we took more selfies with him we we spoke what are our problems and you know he's a very very uh, young scientist at heart and uh, all in activities. So thank you so much for your uh, support, sir. And uh, this webinar series is uh, we are going to have is especially for women empowerment, PhD and girl student. And um, this is in collaboration with Indian National Young uh, Academy and Global Young Academy and uh, Institute of Chemical Technology. We are going to have various topics, including gender rights, equality, and we have experts like um, those who have, you know, designed in task force, UGC's task force committee, which has uh, laid by UGC and in which they have the, uh, written various rules and regulations for gender equality. So we have members who are going to speak or speakers uh, uh, who are going to speak on the very relevant, uh, relevant topic. Then uh, we today had a balancing career and life um, uh, lecture and then you know how being a woman scientist uh, we have to face difficulties and many such relevant topics uh, are being included so now today i would like to pose questions from the audiences to you so thank you so much for this wonderful talk one of our uh, audience shilpa asked like uh, do you have any message for ambitious women scientist who has a career in break due to you know family problems or how to come back in this competitive corporate world again Hello, uh, can you hear, sir? Yeah, yeah, and you can hear me too now because see, you you censored me. I, I can't speak. You unmute. You muted me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a by default uh, option. So. <laughs> I know, I know, no, no, no worries. You see, uh, it's very interesting what you said about young and old people because this is another diversity that we should know how to negotiate. So, to my mind, uh, there are no old people. Okay, I mean, uh, well, of course, when I was a teenager, I thought everybody over 30 is old, right? Uh, but all of us will get there. The whole point is uh, that this is another divide that we have created, just like gender divide. There's a woman, there's a man, and, you know, they are like very different and so on, right? Um, so I think it's very important uh, that we recognize the fact uh, that there are no old people, okay? Whether they look old is a different thing, uh, but they're no old people. I uh, see this is a stereotype that people start taking seriously after a while. So if I am if I'm older or not so young, then I'm supposed to behave in a certain way. So so just like you, woman is supposed to behave in another way, right? So this becomes a will of society. We must fight that stereotype all the time, right? Is, is being from a small town, for example, I already pointed that out, uh, is being about speaking a different language or dressing in a different way. All this is part of diversity. If we cannot live with one kind of diversity, you would not be able to live with any other kind of diversity. Okay, because mind is not selective. Okay, mind always say, hey, your color is different, your food is different, blah, 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 right? And you know that you are different. Now, actually, the human mind is designed for differentiation. It is not designed for integration. 
Okay, so what that means is the slightest difference between the two of us would be amplified because this is where we would focus, right? Just think about it. And now, anyway, uh, your, your question was, do you have any message for ambitious women who has career in break and how to come back in this competitive world again? Uh, so message is, uh, you see that people accept nowadays uh, that women would take some amount of break in their career, right? So now, I mean, it's also not possible for them not to take break. I'm not saying they should not take break. I mean, it is a personal decision. Uh, one can do that. Right, but I, I don't pass any uh, moral uh, judgment or any other kind of judgment on that personal choice. Okay, so now if we do take break, it, it is true that if, if you have a permanent job, then it's not a problem. Especially if it's a government job, is no problem at all. Okay, I, I have actually people here working in my office uh, who have been on leave for two years, whatever maternity, paternity leave and so on, and that's allowed. Now in corporate sector also, now things are much more relaxed. And the whole point is, if they see the value, I mean, they would take you back, right? Uh, it's all a question of uh, well, how valuable uh, you were as a worker to them. It doesn't really matter if it's woman or man, at least for enlightened uh, boss uh, or uh, the management, uh, right? So if you're working there earlier, you can work there again fact is that you would lose one or two years or whatever it takes, right? And we have to accept that fact because it's like you gain some, you lose some. It's not, it's never, the world is not fair, unfortunately, because you didn't make this world. I didn't make this world. Maybe it would have been more fair. I don't really know. Maybe it was designed better, right? But we don't have it. So <laughs> often people, there is a gap between how the world is and what is our concept of an ideal world is. And is a gap between the two, which produces a lot of worries and stress and depression. And who knows what at the end of it, right? Yes. So, so please, uh, you know, it, it is true that uh, if you want to take a break, uh, I think take a break. Uh, and you see a uh, year or two in the long run, they actually get all canceled out. It's only a question of your talent uh, your drive, your ambition, and so on, right? Uh, it's also, look, look, it's very simple. Some people do PhD in three years, some do in six years. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that now you are going to be basically be behind everybody for the rest of your life. You know, one year here, two years there, they pass in a ziffy. I mean, uh, but by the same time, there's no, no point being very stressed out about it. Um, you know, I have lost a lot of time in my life, but I was never stressed out. It's not a woman's issue alone, right? So when I joined IIT Kanpur in 90, there was no infrastructure, there was no culture of research, there was no DST, there was no money for research, right? And uh, believe it or not, there were six PhD students in the entire department of chemical engineering of 20 faculty members. Now, if I tell this today to younger people, they would just make faces. And they say, I don't understand this. Anyway, this is all past. Uh, it is past, but there is a message in it. The message is that the world is not ideal. And you have to make the best of the world that you got. Right? So a whole lot of uh, people with me, they were very disheartened. And they said, I cannot work here. This is terrible. Then I inactivate myself and we go in hibernation. After that, we start blaming the whole world for our failure and so on that should never happen, right? So no matter what your gender, no matter what your age, uh, you see, if you find something better, we should take that. But uh, it's no point just keep complaining about it. Um, so we, we have to make the best of the world that is given to us. Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful, you know, um, convincing answer. And I'm sure many of the women scientists who had a break uh, in their career will be no matter what is the difficulty, they will go ahead. Another uh, audience uh, called Chavi is asking, uh, women especially or girls are not considered appropriate, especially in engineering or technology industries and industries 
prefer boys or girls thinking that uh, they won't be able to travel or they are not appropriate so how how to handle this situation or what can be done well so i mean f- first one has to make a choice am i going to be traveling or not traveling then one has to look for an appropriate job that satisfies the parameters of who you are and what you wish to do in life you see now everybody can do everything right so there are uh, constraints on everybody and because of the gender these constraints are amplified i agree with that all right uh, but anyway because you know if i don't want to do certain kind of thing i should not be in that profession but i must say that engineering is not one of those professions okay so you know it is not necessary that uh, you know that you would be on the shop floor all the time okay i mean right there are a whole lot of opportunities in engineering uh, wherein uh, the 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 parameters uh, for most women can be satisfied and and moreover now with the with the with the rise of digital technologies and rise of digital in everything the right uh, the the rise of cyber in everything uh there are opportunities which are really tailor made uh for women scientists no matter how you look at it so now is a great time to roll up our sleeves and uh, be part of that change yeah thank you so and much sir and dr arya if we just had you know 1000 more women like you then we already there <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much sir for this wonderful compliment um well there is another question from one of the audience uh, the audience uh-huh. asked what kind of training is provided under uh, gyan jyoti and can universities participate in this vigyan jyoti program and how do we find the list of such candidates yeah absolutely absolutely this is actually with the participation of the whole enlightened section of society whether it is university wherever so look every district is going to have a one to three such centers uh, which we have decided first to establish uh, in um, uh in in these uh, centrally administered schools right and so that we would uh, you know so there is a place and there is a, a psychologically um uh, a good place uh, for girls uh, is a protective space uh, and then we want actually uh, people from universities people from iits icers wherever they are institutes like yours ict uh, uh, right Uh, all actually come and participate in that training program so training has different aspects the first aspect of training is what we call by other names a rather vulgar name it is called coaching right so i don't like to use that name coaching it is it must be enlightened training so for those girls whose parents are not sending them uh, to institutes or mandis this is going to be far better right we're going to be far better because it's is done by uh, you know a whole lot of this is voluntary workforce and these are you know maybe professor here professor there whatever they're spending some time doing it right the second aspect of uh, teaching or training which is equally important maybe even more important uh, is about the cultural aspects and confidence building so all the questions that you are asking here today is the very detailed answers to this in practice in operation have to be provided by these camps so they will call vigyan jyoti science camps right uh, and uh, so so it's a holistic program in which you realize that this is a multi dimensional problem there is not a single solution right so those girls that need financial assistance they get financial assistance uh, the girls whose parents are reluctant to send them uh, we convince them so in fact the first of these 12 camps uh, were 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 tried out last year a, as a uh, pilot and the transformation we saw in these girls just in 3 weeks so some of these camps were 2 weeks to 3 weeks uh, many of them residential in iits and i we we got stuff a lot of parents were writing they were saying i saw a change in my girl uh, before and after right Uh, so because they get hugely inspired you know it's when you see science in operation when you go look in the you know what are all these labs what is happening here what's going on right and moreover they are given this lesson that you can do it i mean right 
So this confidence, it, it reflects on the glow uh, in their face as well as their parents. And they were saying, I'm going to recommend this also to my neighbors, right? So everybody is welcome to participate in this. We also would need a lot of role models, uh, especially women, uh, whether they're in corporate sector, whether they are in universities, IITs, wherever. Uh, so if these women, uh, they come and interact uh, with these girls, uh, that would bring confidence. And they would be able to actually you know, address many of these issues that you're asking uh, by experience, right? And yes. so we, we also have a policy coming up, which should be notified in a month or two. Uh, this is called scientific social responsibility. And part of that scientific social responsibility uh, is all our academic institutes, R&D labs, so, so on and so forth, for them to be involved in these kind of activities. Right? So it's, it, this is an example of the activity in which we could be involved uh, and get credit for scientific social responsibility. So SCRB, for example, is going to tag it with uh, projects. You know, let's say there may be a whole list of 20 activities. And depending on what I like, I can tick one or two. It's very minimal, right? I mean, if you spend a couple of hours a month, that would be enough. But imagine the number of scientists we have in the country. If all of us uh, were doing a couple of hours a month, including PhD students, postdocs, and everybody, this would have a huge, huge impact on how we can reach out to society as scientists. True. Thank you very much, sir, for addressing. There are many, many questions, but uh, I would just quickly uh, would like to read one comment from Stuti, and uh, she's saying that I'm very, very happy, sir, to inform you that I was one of the uh, women WOSA program uh, candidate, and after my PLD, and it really, really helped me, and I, I'm so thankful to Department of Science and Technology for such a wonderful opportunity uh, created. So, so she's complimenting DST. Uh, no, 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 let me clarify. Nobody needs to thank DST. Uh, I think it's a misunderstanding because it is DST's job to do whatever they are doing. I wish they do it better. Okay. So there's no question of thanking because this is a not, not a favor. Okay. So, so we must uh, we must separate a favor uh, from what needs to be done. Okay, so I get paid actually for doing this. Yeah, thank so they you. They don't need to thank either me or anybody else. Only thing you need to do is, uh, you see, oftentimes, um, you know, this uh, our frustration it leads to something a lot of negativity, right? The point is, we are all humans. So, a certain amount of trolling and negativity and so on, it plays on everybody, right? So while one may not say things which are very positive, it's often good not to say too many things which are strongly negative. That keeps everybody's morale high, right? And this is actually a general thing I've learned in life. I just never pay any attention to anything uh, which is negative, unless I can change it, okay? And, and so that is a way that you maintain uh, your energy because otherwise your energy would leak out like this. I know people who keep drinking a lot of tea during the day, especially in universities, uh, in all the institutes, there are little groups. Uh, they go sit in the canteen, then they sit there for two hours, then they drink a lot of tea. And meanwhile, they are doing negative gossip all the time, right? And this is one of the things that is really destroying uh, our institutions, right? Because by gossip and by criticism, uh, nobody has ever improved. So this is a measure of letting out our frustration, but in a negative way. The same two hours, the same criticism, each one of us have to use that for bringing a positive change. Because it's not somebody out there who's responsible for change. You know, there's another mistake that everybody makes. 90% people that I meet, they do this huge mistake of thinking that there's a God up there who is going to change things. Uh, maybe it is, you know, some big politician, maybe it is some secretary, maybe it is my head of the department, maybe it is my director. Our director wants to change it, I know. He's right there, right? <laughs> but the whole point is we cannot let go of our individual responsibility for change. No change has ever happened 
if Absolutely. you look outside for the change, right? And I, I cannot emphasize this more. I have seen so many people go horribly wrong with this, right? They have always been waiting for a Messiah to come and bail them out. It's not going to happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. And hats off to your energy and motivational talk. I, I just in the morning at 10.30 in science leadership program, I heard you and I after listening motivating talk from there, you know, same energy enthusiasm you have in the evening. You are wonderful. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you. Uh, for accepting the invitation and that too on a very short notice. So, and I'm looking forward uh, for more collaboration, uh, particularly on this special topic, but because I, I think and our institute and everybody, many uh, organization at the world, they think that women rights sensitization and their empowerment is very, very, uh, very, very essential, very, very necessary. And that is what is lacking. And, uh, uh, we will uh, continue our collaboration on this topic in the near future. So now I formally request Professor Prakash Mahanwar, who is our Dean, uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, to, to present a vote of thanks and uh, end this program. Oh, so I stay, stay now or go? Uh, it is up. Like yeah, it is now. The meeting is over. Yes. Meeting is almost over. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I really uh, appreciate the efforts taken by uh, Dr. Shalini Arya. Uh, it's, uh, it gives me great pleasure to thank the uh, speakers who have given really uh, good inputs, specifically uh, Professor Rolla, who has talked about uh, how to balance the uh, family life, career, and uh, uh, go ahead with. Whereas the Professor Ashuto Sharma, he has given uh, insights of what are the opportunities available, what DST thinks about for the uh, women scientists and women. And uh, this gives the opportunities for all the participants to uh, go ahead with their uh, plans long way. And uh, with this, I really thank both the speakers because uh, Charini has invited them just four days before, and they accepted our invitation wholeheartedly. Similarly, I appreciate the efforts and support given by Professor A.P. Pandit, our Vice Chancellor. Uh, similarly, I thank Professor Padma Devarajan, who is the TQ coordinator for supporting us uh, in all the way. And uh, last but not the least, I should thank all the participants who uh, stick to this um, uh, seminar for last two hours and uh, similarly uh, managing the show very well to Dr. Shalini Arya. Thank you very much. I wish all everybody will stay safe and stay home. Thank you very much. And we'll I allow this. Yeah, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, Good thank night. you, sir. Good night. Good night. And before we... Thanks, I have a few announcements for everyone. Uh, I have posted uh, the link for tomorrow's session in this chat group. You can copy the tomorrow's link. And we have a Facebook page called Empower uh, Women Empowerment um, and uh, Women Rights. So you can join that Facebook page and you will get many updates. You can actively participate on the Facebook page. And our today's uh, lectures have been recorded live stream on YouTube channel of Institute of Chemical Technology. If you do do internet connection were unable to watch today's uh, talk, inspirational talks, you are free to watch on the YouTube uh, channel. I have already sent the link and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for just your quick, Just a quick suggestion, uh, Dr. Arya. Yes, sir. In the good old days, uh, speakers got a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> uh, I, I think you can send uh, one virtual uh, bouquet wow. of flowers. Wow, yes. it's a very nice thing. You know, the, to, yeah, to complete the experience. Okay, yes. good night. Yeah. Charlie, Thanks a lot. Charlie, please yeah. announce the time tomorrow. It's not five o'clock. So yes, please tomorrow's time is 3 30. Tomorrow's time is 3 30 because we have a different time. Professor Mary from UGC had uh, uh, that time slot available. So tomorrow, see you at 3 30. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you so much, Padma Madam. Thank you. Thank you too.
Thank you so Thank much, you, sir, well for all the support. Charlie, well good. Well done. Very good. Yes. Well Thank done. you, sir. Really, and both the sessions were really wonderful. Very excellent. Wonderful. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Super choice. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. I think that the remaining lectures also are very good. Huh? Many yeah. more, yeah, sir. Yeah. Tomorrow's yeah. session from Professor Mary, especially, is going to be on what is gender, because you know she is an expert in that area and. She has a lot of YouTube videos also. So it will be very interesting. And we have every day one international speaker and one national speaker. So tomorrow yeah. we have Gada Basisani, uh, who will again talk on women empowerment. She's a great leader, international leader, has been speaking on many international forums. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to have a very good discussions and messages from all these experts. Yes. OK, Arya, Shalini, I'll have to leave. Yes, sir. Thanks thank you so and much. Well for done. Your yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Uh, Professor Padma? Oh, yeah.